Welcome to the show. It is getting serious now with this coronavirus, COVID-19. We're going to be talking to Paul Cullen from the Irish Times in a second. And we will also talk to Dr. Ida Milne, M-I-L-N-E, European History Lecturer at Carlo College. She's one of the eminent historians of the Spanish flu. She wrote a book about it as well and her comparisons with it. We want to hear from you if you're having a leap day birthday tomorrow or if you're thinking of proposing or if you're afraid somebody's going to propose to you on, <laughs> on the leap day. And we're also going to be talking to Maureen Tobin and Breda Murphy about Waterford Women's Day. And also we want to hear about the U2 gig 40 years ago this week. Weekend. Let us know, please, where are you at it? Uh, Paul Cullen, good morning. Hi, good morning to you. What's your favourite U2 song, Paul? Ah, they were never one of my favourite bands, I'm afraid. No, um, no, really? Yeah, no, sorry, good question. Very quickly, um, uh, <laughs> the New Orleans one, what is it? Rattle and Hum, one of the Rattle and yeah, Hum. Yeah, one of the Rattle and Hum ones, maybe. Oh, no, oh, there's a very rare one um, on a film soundtrack, uh, the film's called To the End of the World and there's a U2 song on that and it's really good. But I can't think of the title. OK, well, anybody wants to text us in, please do. Yeah, 83. there was a film <laughs> film, To the End of the World and it's got Nick Cave and U2. And OK, and we'll try and find out that. 83 975 Paul Cullen, Irish Times health correspondent. You're on a day off, but you're never on a day off. I really appreciate you taking the call. Thank you so much. Um, listen, this is getting serious. It is, yeah. It's getting serious in the way expected, I suppose. The first thing is... Um, uh, the usual thing, I suppose you could say, don't panic. There's no reason for panic. Uh, um, what happened last night in uh, Belfast, where the first test in Ireland was announced, and it really is an all-Ireland uh, event because uh, the, the person travelled to the Dublin airport um, on public transport up to Belfast, and it just happened that the test was done in the north. Um, but it really is something that uh, public health doctors have been expecting for some days, really, and it may not be the last one. Yeah. Um, C- so, can I ask you, know, you Paul, j- just on this quite specifically, because I was thinking about this last night, and uh, Dr. Milne will be talking to us in a little while, and she'll be talking about trust, and the trust that the public has with its health authorities is, is fundamental to the, you could say, the, a functioning democracy, OK? Yeah. Now, this woman got on a plane. She was disembarked at Dublin, got on some kind of transport. They haven't said if it was her own car or how she travelled up to Belfast. Do you not think it's incumbent on the authorities to say, without creating a panic, but let's be totally and utterly transparent and honest with the general public in Ireland and say, listen, she was on flight EI, whatever it was. It landed in Dublin on this time. Uh, And in other words, let's get those, because we now have 24 hours of a period from now they found out about this lady up in Belfast to effectively another 24 hours has been wasted with people that thinking, God, and, and, and they could have the thing. Like, why haven't they literally said this is the flight she was on? Well, because I think the uh, business of uh, tracing contacts is a targeted exercise. As you know, there are flight manifests. We all uh, fill in our phone numbers and our addresses. So they'll have no problem at all uh, tracing the people who were in the nearest rows to this woman, it's really only the people who were in near rows to, to, to this passenger and her child. Um, and they, well, no, I, I not, not necessarily, they because if she... They don't I'm, need to tell, they don't need to get a load of other people uh, <coughs> worrying about uh, unnecessary things. But Paul, Paul, listen, it's not unnecessary worry. It's a public health information thing. They need to find out the people who are on that plane. That woman could have got up and gone to the toilet. <laughs> So would it not have been better for them to say, listen, folks, anybody that was on this flight, will you please contact us? Now they're wasting well, time I, trying to contact I'm people. I'm sure they can speak for themselves. But I, I ask you, Damien, how, how would that benefit anyone? Because there would be a quicker transfer of information about how people are, how are they feeling now, do you think you should be self-quarantined? So remember, remember what the, public, the general public health advice is, that if you're coming back from an affected area, and um, this is an affected area, Italy, um, you are... Um, if you have symptoms, you're to contact your GP. That's the general health advice, right? Um, if you're feeling well, you're just to monitor yourself and you can check for information on the HSC. And if you develop symptoms, then you contact. So, so, so there, there is general guidance there for people who are coming back on flights from Italy. It's covered. Okay. That's, that's as much as you can do, to be honest with you, rather than creating widespread concern among people who don't need to be, uh, need to be bothered about this at all. So do you think now, that... I, again, I'm not speaking for the public health authority. No, I know you're I'm not. I'm observing how they're working. Yeah. I have to commend them. I think they've done a very good job. We've been lucky in the sense that we're one of the last countries in Europe to record a case. 
So every day buys you more time, more knowledge, more expertise, um, more uh, knowledge from other countries and how they've dealt with it. And we've seen that in the vast majority of European countries, apart from Italy, um, so far anyway, where cases have arisen, um, they've been tracked down and the context has been tracked down and um, people have been given uh, treatment promptly. Mm. And, you know, the public pay their part in that role by being alert to what's going on. And obviously, uh, anyone who was through Dublin Airport in the last few days coming from Italy is going to say, well, I better watch how I am and see how my health is and immediately contact a doctor if, uh, if need be. Yeah, and it's not a case of creating mass hysteria. I agree with you. You don't want to create mass hysteria. Nobody's talking about that. But it's this unknown. And if, there's, if we're heading into an unknown period, that as much effort is made as possible to track down the known unknowns as quickly as possible. And I just think it might have been better to say she was on this flight, she got this train. Anybody that's been on that train and on that flight, please contact us. Simple as that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, Damien, um, I really think that the, the business of tracing the airline uh, passengers will be very simple. Yes. Uh, it will be a greater challenge to track down uh, train passengers Yes. Uh, because of the nature of the way we buy tickets and so on. And you may see, uh, and there is a briefing this morning, you may see uh, public um, uh, queries being put out uh, asking people to come forward if they were in such and such a train or such and such a service. But they really need to drill down exactly and get the information and, and concern themselves solely with the route of travel taken by this person and not other planes or other trains mm. and unnecessarily um, information that we really, you know, for, where people don't need to worry. They don't need to worry. I'd agree with you. And yeah. that is a Clearly very, there is very important point. you're on the same train or on the same plane as a person. But you have to get this in perspective. Um, we're really only talking about people being at risk if they're a close contact of somebody. And, and they're saying that's about two rows away. Uh, you, you, you validly raise points about using toilets and so on. Um, uh, but I think the first thing you're, you're doing is trying to track down people who are in the immediate yeah. uh, adjacent seats and, and be, be, uh, ahead and behind. Yeah, I was talking to somebody involved in the, the, the uh, ambulance sector this morning and ambulances are being used to bring people at present in for a swabbing, yeah. a swabbing exercise and they're saying that there's possibly a misuse of resources there that the people should be told yeah, to drive. Yeah, they've changed in. that protocol though. Oh, have they? They have, yeah. And, and maybe it was, uh, I, I sense the ambulance staff weren't uh, too pleased about it, but uh, these ambulances need to be used for other health services, obviously. They yes. have to be decontaminated afterwards. So what they're doing now is that they are um, advising that people can make their own way, uh, make their own arrangements okay, so that's for transport changed. to the hospital. But there's also an issue about should we be carrying out the test uh, in, in hospitals? We have EDs, are very, uh, our emergency, emergency departments are very full. Maybe that's not the best place. Maybe uh, public health staff should be going out to the place of residence of the person who needs to be tested and doing it there. Yeah, OK. I Listen, think that Paul, will change. Appreciate it. We might talk to you next week and thank you very much. No, no doubt. We'll run. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. God bless. Bye. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Mind yourself. Paul Cullen, Irish Times health correspondent. Uh, a lot of people texting in, Damien. They need to get the people's details from the airline. Phone the people. They're concerned if they're concerned. Uh, we're doing everything we can to let this system, let, let, it, let, let it come into Ireland, says this person. There should be more done. Damien, you're right about saying what this, uh, what should have been done first. Damien, have, anything, have the government anything planned to stop Italian rugby fans coming to Ireland next week? Damien, looks like we're doing our best to make sure we get the virus in Ireland. I don't agree that, like, obviously we're not trying to get the virus in Ireland, but, like, are there systems in place to, to minimise and to maybe... That's what I'm talking about. Damien, you might not have symptoms for up to two weeks. Uh, Damien, don't be, um, don't be hyping this up too much. Uh, don't be creating hysteria. No, I said I'm not going to try and do that. It's just literally systems that, that, that work with this. A text into WhatsApp. Hello, Damien, we have a child with uh, CF along with other people with underlying problems. We need all information to protect ourselves. It's life-threatening. Very important point. Uh, RT News just now have said that all the people on the flight have been notified. Uh, Damien, she shouldn't have been left on the plane if she was in the infected area. And people texting in about the U2 song. Uh, we're going to talk to Dr. Ida Milne, M-I-L-N-E, uh, in a second. Um, very interesting about what she has to say about the Spanish flu. Now, Dr. Ida Milne is European history lecturer at Carlo College, historian of disease and particularly on Spanish flu. She has written uh, the textbook on this influenza war and revolution in Ireland. Dr. Milne, good morning. Good morning, Damien. How are you? I'm wonderful, thanks. Tell me a little bit about your, I suppose, expertise in this. You have a, an extensive knowledge of viruses and diseases, particularly 
in history? Yes, um, I, I look at the history of, uh, particularly of the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic that was my PhD work. And I published a book on it two years ago on, on the flu, which was really just in time for the centenary of it. And uh, surprisingly, you know, very few people knew about this disease. We hadn't really told that story in Irish history. And, and um, yeah, you know, the disease that affected 50 million people in the world or killed 50 million people in the world. And tell me a little bit about your, uh, I suppose, is it possible to make comparisons at this early stage with the coronavirus, with COVID-19? Oh, I have been for the last, um, since the coronavirus began to emerge, I have been just sitting absolutely enthralled if it's uh, not a terrible thing to say about a disease that is making so many people sick and, and, and killing so many people as well. Um, but it is the parallels are incredible. The scary titles of the, in the newspapers. Um, uh, you know, a, a lot of my work was actually done on newspaper research because that was the main source I had as well as um, interviewing people who had lived through the Great Flu as, as children and were then in their 90s when they were telling me the stories about it. And so you see from the newspapers that uh, just like happened in Wuhan, that whole communities would go silent because some people would be uh, confined out of self-quarantining even then. Uh, They would be too afraid to go out. They would be too too afraid to let the children go out in case they caught the flu. And people told me this as well. And then um, businesses would go quiet, um, partly because, again, people were afraid to to move around the place, but partly because staffs would become ill. Uh, Things like services were disrupted. Um, The police would have been short of numbers. The hospital staff, of course, went sick as well themselves. So they were short of of, of, of staff too. Um, So, you know, the parallels are kind of, uh, they're fascinating to watch. You know, it would seem that each major epidemic of a disease has a lot, of, you know, particularly with something like this, you know, a, a coronavirus, which flu is as well, where it's spread by sneezing and by close contact rather than, say, maybe like a, a diarrhea illness, which might be slightly different in the way it spreads, that the parallels are, are um, that there are so many parallels that you can draw with it. Yeah, like obviously some people would say a hundred years ago things were a lot different. People didn't travel around as much and our hygiene standards are a lot greater now. And yet, even if our hygiene standards are better now and there's less, I suppose, bacteria around, we have this massive problem of travel, if you want to call it a problem. And we have the idea that people, a virus can spread quicker. Would that be fair enough to say? Yes. Yeah, I think that's the thing that, you know, um, medicine has been waiting for something like this to happen for for a long time. Um, uh, it's, I think it's known as disease X, the, the disease we don't know that could confound um, uh, all the, the developments in medicine and the developments in public health and as well the individual knowledge which will be a lot stronger. The, the, the ordinary individual person has a lot more medical knowledge than they would have had um, back in 1918, 1919 and also we have... Um, you know, in 1918, 1919, they still thought uh, things like flu were caused by bacteria, whereas now we know it's a virus and we know how a virus behaves more and we know how to treat it a lot more. Um, things that are also better would be that um, back in 1918, they wouldn't have had, you know, packets of paracetamol that you could buy in a local shop and uh, to, to, to help control your temperature and things like that. So we, we know how to nurse ourselves a lot better and I think that will be a big difference. But yes, it will definitely spread a lot quicker um, if we don't, you know, if the containment measures don't work because uh, things like airplanes where you're, you are in a closed space and you're passing by nearly everybody else on the plane as you get to your seat and or go to the toilet or that the stewards, um, you know, pass around the the, the food, etc. on the plane. That all yes. that is, is, is a possibility of contagion. What's your feeling on it, Ida, uh, in terms of what's going to happen? I know that's a, a, a um, million well, dollar question, but what do you think? It's almost impossible to predict because scientists, I'm not a scientist, I'm a historian, um, they, they would say that the disease can change. And that's what they don't know yet. Like, you know, that it could change, that in some populations they won't be as badly affected. Um, it's it's scary. It's exciting. It's a challenge for modern medicine to see whether we have improved a lot in the last hundred years. Um, what it 
the thing I would be scared about it here is that our medical system, uh, just like it actually was in 1918, um, is already stretched to the limit with things like seasonal flu and, and uh, other issues. You know, So how would they go to find the capacity if there is a major outbreak? And I think that yeah. what they are trying to do, uh, you know, I've been listening to my microbiologist colleagues uh, who I always consult about things, uh, about my own work anyway, to try and find it a then and now comparison. And they would say the whole thing now is to try and slow it down and to make sure that hospitals are not overwhelmed. And that's why the, the importance of things like cancelling the rugby matches, so that you don't have a big cluster of people all very ill at the same time. Yes. And, and that's the whole thing now is about, it's about slowing it down. Just a reminder. Slowing down the major cases. Remind our listeners, Ida, how was Spanish flu counteracted? Was there a, uh, a cure found for it, if that's the right way of putting it? There was absolutely no cure for it because, um, you know, um, well, even today, how do you cure a virus? Uh, but a lot of what happened, just like with the Wuhan coronavirus, is that there were secondary infections like pneumonias and things coming with it as well. And um, I think we had about 3,000 deaths from, from associated pneumonias. There was about 20,000 deaths from the flu uh, then in Ireland. In Ireland, yeah. And from the flu itself. And 3,000, as I say, ex- extra de- deaths from pneumonias that, where people would have got the flu and then got pneumonia. Um, so even then they had no antibiotics. Then they had no antibiotics to treat um, uh, the pneumonias, but now we would have. So that that is a uh, major advantage. Uh, back then, doctors threw everything in their medical bag at it. Um, they uh, usually gave something like quinine to reduce the fever. Um, aspirin was quite new. Uh, sorry, uh, um, Bayer were making aspirin at the time, um, the German company. But because they were German, there was a, a feeling, particularly in America, uh, that Bayer had um, introduced the flu into the aspirin, and that's what was spreading it because they were, of course, then the enemy in the the First World War. And um, so you can see then, just as now, that there's a lot of the kind of conspiracy theories uh, were were, um, part of the flu story, if you like. Uh, Just as now we hear hear different um, stories about this having escaped from a bioterrorism facility and, and, you know, other things like that that are... Uh, part of the normal scare because people always worry is something being kept back from us? Is something being hidden? Mm. And I suppose if I was to talk directly to the health authorities, that's the one thing I would say is be totally honest with us uh, because that's we really need to have a relationship of trust uh, with our health services um, now. And uh, people in scare situations are always thinking people are keeping information back from us. It's part of the natural human condition, I suppose, about fear. Are you a little bit worried? Yes, very. <laughs> um, and I laugh nervously, I should say. I'm not, um, because there are, I know in your community as well, there are schools that have come back from Italy and there are parents who are anxious, anxiously watching their children. Uh, I have two asthmatic daughters. Um, so yes, um, I'm, I, I would have to say I am worried. Uh, but um, what would you say? Um, I think the best thing we can do is all, with the hindsight of 1918, and we, we know that um, most people survived in 1918, even though people talk about it being a dreadful, dreadful disease. About 800,000 people in Ireland caught the disease and only 23,000 died. Right. So, you know, most people will survive. That is about the same rate of death that seems to be happening um, in Wuhan with the flu, like about 2.5% uh, of the people there who catch it survive, um, die and the rest survive. And that's the important thing to remember is that, you know, most people will survive. But also things like, you know, that everybody's talking about good hand washing is, is, is probably the best thing we can do for ourselves and to teach our children how to, to practice good hand washing as well. And this is what my, my microbiologist friends are all uh, telling me when I ask them, you know, what, yes. what can we do? And they, this is what they keep emphasising. Ida, take care. We might talk to you next week, please, God, and mind yourself and your children.
Uh, take care, you too. Thanks, thanks, Ida. Uh, my daughter's eleven says this texter. She said the amount of children in the class that don't cover their nose or mouth when coughing or sneezing is alarming. Other people talking about at mass when people are coughing and sneezing, then shaking hands. Damien, what containment measure? Someone flew out of Milan on Tuesday. Was body scanned over there, then walked straight through Dublin Airport. It's monumental incompetence. As for being ready, they can't get people off the trolleys in A and E. Yesterday, there were six hundred people on trolleys alone across the country. Let us know what you think, please. 83 975 Next, we're going to be talking about leap year babies. This will be lovely. Now, I want to do a big shout out to 12-year-old Daniel Murray uh, from his nanny, his aunties, his cousins, his brother Craig and Samantha. Uh, happy birthday. He is going to be 12 tomorrow. Now, I've been talking to some people this morning who are also celebrating birthdays tomorrow. Firstly, I spoke this morning to Vicky Whelan, who is in on Rhine with her son just before they went to school. Hello? Vicky, Damien Tiernan, how are you? Hello, how are you? I'm wonderful, thanks. I'm wonderful. What's the weather like in Ring this morning? Oh, very wet and windy, <laughs> as usual. And uh, the little boy is there, is he? He's here, yeah. Ah, lovely. What's his name, Vicky? Jake. Jake? Yep, that's it. And how old is he? Jake will be eight tomorrow. Ah, oh. Vicky Whelan, you're in on Ryan, and um, you had Jake eight years ago, is it? Eight years ago, yeah. And tell us about your your due date. Was your due date on the 29th of February, or no, I was due on the 27th and went in and had to be induced for a couple of days, and nothing happened. And then the morning of the 29th, they said we're going to section you today. I didn't even think of anything big deal being the 29th but they, they all came in and said you know it's the leap year it's a very special day and some of the nurses were talking about us, what day you would celebrate the birthday and some people would say the 28th and other people were saying the 1st but we've always done it the 28th kept it in February uh, yeah. and uh it's 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 supposed to be like a special birthday, a special day, and obviously it is it a special is. day. And uh, anybody any born on, anybody born on a leap day is supposed to be special. Tell us a little bit about Jake. We'll talk to him in a second. Tell me about him. Jake is brilliant. He's really caring. He's got two younger siblings. Ben and Cara and he's very helpful with them and always coming with me to help me do things around the house and do shopping and he loves Lego, he loves Minecraft, he's really starting to get into like reading, Roald Dahl books yeah, he's just starting to learn he's just starting to learn to read English he goes to an all Irish school so English uh, is starting to and as he was growing up, did you ever talk to him about the fact that he was born on, on, on he, a leap day? He never really understood it. We spoke to him a lot about it, but he never really understood it. It's only kind of this year that he's getting an understanding of it and getting excited about it. And yeah, this year, really, every other year, it was kind of just a blur to him. He didn't really know. And you're planning a big party on Saturday tomorrow? We are planning a big party tomorrow. Ah. He's got all his school friends coming and... Brother talking, his brother's coming too. Okay, put me on to put me on to Jake there, and I'll have a little chat with him. Thanks, Vicky. No problem. We'll put you on now. Hi, Jake. Hello, Jake. Hello. How are you? Good. Tell me about your birthday. Happy birthday, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> How old are you going to be tomorrow? Eight. Eight. And are you excited? Yes, I'm very excited. Tell me, what are you going to do tomorrow? What's the plan? Well, the plan is, I think, that I should have a big game with my friends for soccer or something. And how many are coming to your party? Mm-hmm. Uh... Twenty. Wow, that's brilliant. Shingahoon took her fod. And uh, is, is Fader like kind of Yes. Fader. And uh, are you really excited about being a, a leap year boy? What do you think of it being a leap year boy? Uh, cool. It is cool, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so special. And uh, leap year children are supposed to be extra special. So it feels great. Yeah, it feels very great. Ah, you're very good. Well, listen, have a great birthday, Jake. Enjoy your party. And put me back to your mother there for a second and we'll talk to you soon, OK? Happy birthday, Thank Jake. You. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Ah, Vicky, that's super. Listen, well done. Have a great day tomorrow. I know the weather's going to be a bit wet, but you'll still have a great day. It doesn't matter. Ah, that's it. We're going to be inside anyway in, in the holla over a ring and... 
Go the rain won't bother us at all. Ah, oh, that'll be great. Well, well done. Well, listen, have a great day and uh, happy birthday to Jake and talk to you again, Vicky. No problem. Thanks for having me, Damien. Neve Whelan, good morning. Morning. Where are you, Neve? I'm just at home at the minute. And where's home for you? Riverwalk. Up in, uh, in Waterford City, yeah? Yeah. Lovely. And tell me about your birthday. Is tomorrow your birthday? It is, yeah. How old will you be? 20. But if you're going on leap years, I'll be five. <laughs> <laughs> How has it been? What's it like to be a leap year child? Pretty normal. I mean, usually when you tell anyone, you get the same question the whole time of what day do you celebrate it when it's not a leap year? And usually there's a bit of giving out about that. <laughs> And what day or what date have you been celebrating it over the years? Um, I celebrated the 28th. People always give out that I don't celebrate the 1st because I can't celebrate it early. But I always say that I wasn't born in March, I was born in February. Aha, very good, yes. And uh, <laughs> when you were growing up, like, I know you probably got bored with people asking you that question or saying, oh, you're really only a fourth of your age, did you? Everyone's always messing about it. It's, uh, you get a little bit tired of it after a while. <laughs> and uh, they say it is special, like anybody born on a leap year day, there, there's not too many people. So there, do, do you feel different, special, or is it just a birthday? Um, it's just a birthday to me, but I don't think I've met anyone with the same birthday. Really? Yeah, I think I've heard of people having the same birthday, but I've never met anyone. That was actually born the same day. There's an idea for a festival, isn't it? Get all the leap year <laughs> people together. <laughs> and uh, how do your friends, they, they've all, you, you, you've always had parties as a teenager growing up on the 28th, have you? Yeah, it's always been the 28th. Of course, the 29th would have been a, a bit bigger of a party, but... And what are you doing tomorrow? Um, not too special, actually, this year. I'm just heading out with a few friends. Lovely. Well, listen, happy birthday to you and have a great time and mind yourself. And uh, what are you hoping to do in life, as they say? Uh, I haven't a notion yet. I'm still in college, so we'll see how that goes. And what are you studying? Pharmaceutical science. Lovely. Well, the very best of luck to you. Uh, Neve. thank you very much. Anne-Marie Kennedy, good morning. Good morning. Where is home for you, Anne-Marie? Um, I'm in Tremor. Lovely. And tell me about your leap year celebrations. Well, I've had to wait four years for this birthday. So I'm going to go out tomorrow and have a bit of a nice time, I think, hopefully. We're going to the Tower Hotel and we're going to see Abba-esque. Oh, lovely. That'll be great. What's it been like growing up as a leap year child, Um, Anne-Marie? Actually, it's been very strange because when you're young, a child, you don't understand it's your birthday, but it's not your birthday. You know that way? So I was never interested in parties or birthdays. It just I just acted as if it wasn't my birthday because it wasn't. So I got presents and cards, you know. Um, it's, uh, even now, birthdays don't mean a whole lot to me because I don't have one until every four years. So it's a bit strange. Ah, and like, <laughs> I know, it's sad. <laughs> <laughs> did you feel a bit sad then to be a leap year child? Um, I did, yeah, because I've no birthday, you know. It's like... It's celebrated on the 28th, but that's not my birthday. It's the 29th, so it just doesn't feel like your birthday. But that's how I feel. Maybe other leapers don't mind, but I I was always a bit sad about it. Yeah. But not having a birthday. I felt hard done by. H- hard done <laughs> by. changed. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And is it, is, it, is it rude to ask you your age tomorrow? Well, tomorrow I will be my 13th birthday, so I'll be 52. <laughs> <laughs> and now the whole of Waterford knows how old I am. So I would be actually my, my 13th real birthday. And I'm 52 years. <laughs> I've been around. <laughs> and has it been annoying over the years when you tell people your birthday? Or what, what's the response um, been? Does it, does it bore you, their response? Oh, how do you celebrate that? How do you... Yeah, well, people find it a bit unusual. I don't know. There doesn't seem to be too many of us around. And, you know, people say, oh, it's... You're messing. It's not really, you know, you're not a leap year. And I go, well, yeah, I am. But other people, you know, are fine. You know, it's okay. A lot of people do ask. Like, when it's, tomorrow's my birthday now, a lot of people will say, oh, is it really your birthday? Is it really a leap year? But <laughs> I don't know. I think there's a lot, there is a lot of leap years because there's a group on Facebook for leap year babies. <laughs> 
I was and just... they've organised um, they've actually organised a cruise for tomorrow which I couldn't think of anything worse than spending a cruise with everyone who has the same birthday it's <laughs> a bit strange <laughs> yeah, maybe, was... maybe I'm just maybe I'm just anti-social Damien <laughs> you could have a festival of le- leap year children maybe or people huh yeah absolutely well it'd be interesting to see how many babies will be born tomorrow a whole yes. new generation of leap year babies you know so I'm yes. keeping an eye out for that one see how many will be born tomorrow well, listen, happy birthday to you, uh, 13 Thank years you of very age, much. 13 years of yes. age. And 13 did... years of age, and I got the day off school today. <laughs> <laughs> and did you ever say to, to Mammy and Daddy, why did you have me on, on a leap year day? Oh, uh, well, I don't think she's much choice in that matter. <laughs> she, <couldn't. laughs> she had no choice at all. But look, it's fine. We'll celebrate tomorrow and then I'll wait another four years. You know, it'll what, be fine. <laughs> what, what's your favourite ABBA song? Um... Uh, I can't remember. I like them all. I like all of the songs, so I'll certainly be shouting and roaring them all tomorrow. Hopefully. Super. Well, if we get a chance before the end of the programme, we'll play a little request for you. And listen, Anne Marie. Oh, please do, yes. Please Ke- do. Anne Marie Kennedy and Tremor, happy birthday and have a great night. Thank you very much, Damien. Take care. Bye bye. Declan Foley, good morning. Good morning, Damien. You're down in, in Cove at present, but you're a Ballygunner man, is that it? Well, I've moved to Ballygunner, but I'm really. Uh, a true Ballybricken man. A Ballybricken man. What uh, what street? I was born in Cannon Street. Very good. So you'd know a lot of people up there and sure nearly all of Waterford was born at the top of the town. That's true, yeah. Actually, I, I'm uh, one of seven children. I was the third. My sister was born in 1943, Dorothy. She's living in Cork. But my mother had a little baby, Gerard, in 1945. Only survived for two days. And uh, oh. then when she was pregnant on me, there was a danger she might lose me. So she spent a lot of time on the bed. And the doctor actually prescribed a small bottle of stout every day for her. So we thought it often seeing going into Fal Browns into the smoke to get the, the bottle for her. A bottle of stout off what? the shelf, yeah. My my uncle worked in, in the Guinness Brewery in St. James's Gate and he used to bring out a bottle of stout to my mother. And she had a, a bottle of stout every day as well up in, up in Wicklow where we lived. Uh, yeah, it's supposed to be good for the iron. Yeah, I'm not sure how how good it was really, but I, I survived anyway. Mother is Rita, and she's uh, 97. She's still alive. She's God love her. She's presently a uh, resident in Havenwood. Ah, and how is and, she? Uh, she? She's just there for a week, and she's enjoying it out there. It's given her a new lease of life. She's looking great. Well, we'll say a special hello to her this morning and to all your all your siblings. Uh, what was it like being born on a on a leap day, Declan? Well. Uh, my mother went into labour, she told me, on the 28th at about 11, 11 p.m. And the midwife was saying to her, hurry up and give your give your child a birthday. <laughs> but she, she went over the midnight anyway and into 1 a.m. before I was born. So uh, <laughs> Hurry up, hurry, hurry up and give your child a birthday. <laughs> that's, that's what she said. She always talks about that, but she said, uh, on, on, at that time, it was a Sunday morning, uh, 1 a.m., and... Uh, you wouldn't pass what they call a christening day, a Sunday. So my father had to get up on the bike the early on Sunday morning go off and, and try and get a godfather for me. So he got his good friend Francis Power from Water Street to be my godfather. And uh, I was christened after 12 Mass on the 29th in Ballybricken by the famous Father Michael Farrell, who was famous for raising funds to build the Holy Family Church. Yes, I know the name, yeah. Yeah. But uh, but that godfather Francis, he was great to me. A lot of people said only a birthday every four years, but uh, Francis ignored that and he he sent me a postal order every birthday. It was, it was two and sixpence in the old money, and he sent it by post. And it's a great thrill for a, a small child to get a, a postal order in those days. Yeah, where did he live? Was he uh, in England or he lived, he, he lived in Water Street? Yeah. Oh, he sent it. Tr- yeah, he sent it from. And and w- when did you celebrate your birthday normally on the twenty eighth of February? Is it? Uh, well, I, I used to try and celebrate on the twenty eighth and on the first of March. I used to say I was a bit confused, so I have two celebrations. <laughs> <laughs> I don't only have one this year now. <laughs> <laughs> and leap year children are supposed to be special children. Did you did, did did Mammy ever say to you you're a special child because you were born on the leap day, or what was ever said? Oh yeah, she was. She, she always told me she was. Uh, uh, she felt 
10 foot tall walking me around the pram I was a, a very good looking child and everybody just stopped to admire me <laughs> so uh, she got to make but she entered me for um, a Bonnie Baby competition on the Sunday Independent in 1949 and I was one and Andy Brophy took the photographs but um, it, it's one uh, anyway and they got they got five pounds for the prize, which is a lot of money. Janie, that's a, that, that was a lot of money. Yeah, well, congr- yeah, so she's a, c- congratulations. She's a punch, anyway. yeah. <laughs> and what are you doing uh, tomorrow, uh, Declan? I'm having a, a meal with the with, with my family that are that are nearby, and uh, lovely. But um, and how old are you? My, my, how old are you now in leap year years or in in real years? Well, I'll, I'll be it'll be my eighteenth birthday tomorrow. Can make that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations and happy birthday! And uh, it is. It's. Uh, I suppose you get. Do people believe you when you when when, when you tell them that you were born on the leap day? How they do in general? Yeah, they do. Yeah. And are you well, st- well, well, go on. Well, yeah. Back to Francis. Though. One thing about Francis, uh, he, he impressed me so much as a godfather that when, it, when I became an adult, adult myself, I never forgot his uh, Christmas. I'd always go up to visit him. With a hundred woodbines, he was a great woodbine smoker. And smoke, they, they were they were small, untipped cigarettes. Yes, and they were known as coffin nails in among the wags of Waterford. That's right. Eventually, they killed the poor man, probably. But he, he lived till late eighty years of age. I didn't kill him. He didn't. <laughs> I didn't kill him anyway. <laughs> Listen, happy birthday to you and yours, and all your brothers and sisters, and and to your mother, and uh, special hello to everybody in Havenwood, and have a have a great day, won't you? Yeah, thanks very much, Damien. Thank you very much, Declan. And we've got a text in there now. Will you please tell Declan that Cannon Street is not Ballybrick and he's a Rowan Moore man. That's from Eddie Gallagher. P.S. I remember the Foley's lovely, lovely people. Uh, everybody that has a birthday this weekend, especially tomorrow, happy birthday. My daughter Lisa is a leap year baby. She'll be 20 tomorrow, but it's really only her fifth birthday. That's from Trish. Happy birthday, everyone. Maureen, Maureen, Maureen. There you are now. How's it going? Are you well? Are you well? I'm great, Damien. I'm great this morning. How are you? What's the weather like out there? It is lashing. Absolutely. Lashing. Horrendous. Lashing rain. Absolutely. But we're well used to it at this stage. Thank you so much for coming into us. Appreciate it. Thank you You're a project coordinator, us. Breda Murphy, manager of the Waterford Women's Centre, celebrating 25 years in existence. Congratulations. Thank you, Damien. How are you? We're great. You're dry great. anyway. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be a week of events next week, culminating in the Well Girl Walk on March the 8th. Breda, tell us a little bit about the entire project and I suppose what's happening. Okay, well, we're delighted to be celebrating 25 years. I can't believe it. I've been there since the beginning and it's gone so fast. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to honour and acknowledge thousands of women who have come through our doors and and children, um, staff, volunteers, management members, everybody who has contributed to make the Women's Centre what it is today. Um, We're very proud that we've reached 25 years, which is um, a sizable length of time for uh, uh, what started off as a voluntary organisation. We employ over 20 staff now, part time and, you know, some full time. So it's it's a sizable organisation. Um, so every year for the last 25 years, we've celebrated International Women's Day. We see it as a large event in our calendar and it's grown into a festival over the last few years. Um, so we're starting this year on Tuesday, March 3rd, in Waterford Institute of Technology, College Street, which is just over the road from the Women's Centre. We're, we're situated on 74 to 76 Manor Street. And we have an international um, circle dance led by Kate Crotty, who's our outreach development worker. And Kate is is a wonderful um, facilitator of circle dance also, which is a meditative uh, dance. And so that's at 9.15 until 11.15 in the dance studios in WIT. And I'll come back to you with a bit more of the details in terms of stuff and how to find yep. what's happening. Uh, Maureen, in terms of like these things don't just happen. There's a lot of people work behind the scenes, fundraising committees, different people. OK, well, first of all, Damien, my name is Maureen and thank you for the opportunity to come on this morning and talk about the Well Girl uh, walk, which we're having on the 8th of March, International Women's Day. Um, this is the first f- large fundraiser that the Women's Centre have ever ran. I think it's probably because of the fact they've been so busy doing everything else that there's been no time to raise the head and do anything like fundraising. So recently, a few of us, very passionate and eager women, Uh, who are involved or working in the centre, (coughs) came together in a voluntary capacity and we formed a team 
and we decided to reach out to the community for help uh, for fundraising. These women, they're Catherine Joy, Alison Langford, Catherine McKenna and Liz Heffernan. Um, and we decided to do something that would include the community and uh, not just men, but w- not just women, I should say, but men, all members of the family, um, young and old and we decided on something that wouldn't demand huge levels of fitness. And of course, we're so lucky to be able to use the beautiful water for Greenway that we have on our doorstep. So we set about organising the walk, uh, which originally we thought was going to be very simple. Oh, we'll do a little walk and we make lots of money. And we thought it was going to be as simple as that. But after our first meeting, we realised, oh, we need a bit of support. So we asked Owen O'Neill, who works within Waterford Youth and Community, to come in and give us guidance because uh, Owen has lots of uh, experience in that area and he was wonderful. So anyway we proceeded on from there and we decided to have a walk on the Greenway as I said on the 8th at 11 o'clock Sunday morning the International Women's Day and we it fits in lovely with the events of the uh, the Women's Centre of what's happening that week and because we wanted to make it so accessible to people we said we would just charge 10 euro per person um, and children go free uh, we don't put any pressure on on anybody to take sponsorship cards or to give further donations but of course we'd be delighted if they did um, Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, I'll come back to you in a second. Okay. Uh, Brida, you can run through a few more of the events and how do people, if they want to find out more about things as well? Well, we're all over social media. We're, we, our website, waterwardwomencentre.com, has everything there. Um, and we're delighted on, we, we run what's called a pink plaque campaign, tongue-in-cheek pink plaque. And it's to um, increase the number of blue plaques that you see around to uh, men uh, the majority of the blue plaques we discovered a few years ago were dedicated to men. And so we set about, um, you know, we, we decided we would put up at least one blue plaque annually to a woman or women. So we've done that for the last four years. This is our fourth year. You might remember last year we dedicated one to the Cockle women in Arundel Lane. And this year we're dedicating one to other women in, in Arundel Lane, again, neighbours of, of where the Cockle women used to sit. And they are the Daly sisters and their mother from 1911 to 1981 who ran a cafe for um, homeless men, poor men, out of work dockers. And uh, they ran this cafe, but um, they were they were you know, they were really dedicated women. They were generous, kind women who looked after the poor of Waterford for that number of years, along with looking after their own families. And we're lucky to have Robert Lanigan and Breda Frain, um, (coughs) niece and nephew of the Daly sisters who came on board. So we work very closely with the families when we research something like this. And we research it. Eleanor Murphy is uh, researching the Dailies over the last year. And when um, is that unveiling taking place? So the unveiling has taken place on the 4th of March, Wednesday at 11 o'clock in Arundel Lane. Lovely. And the the mayor of Waterford, John Pratt, will be um, unveil. Well, he will be at the. Be there, yes. He'll be yes, at yeah. it, yeah. And Breed Frain will unveil the plaque to her aunts and her grandmother. Uh, Maureen, anything else you want to give a mention to there? Yeah, I'd just like to say, Damien, we're absolutely thrilled with the response we're getting for the fundraiser from Waterford people. And it's not only from individuals, but also from corporate groups. Uh, We're delighted to have a local man, Alan Quinlan, who has given us huge support in this area. Uh, He's on board as our corporate fundraiser. Excellent. And he's getting, we're really thrilled that he's getting so much support from Waterford groups, Waterford companies uh, and corporate groups. And, And at the moment, we're not at liberty to say how much we've got so far or their names but that will we will let that news out in due course and if people want to register or want to get in touch okay uh, if they want to, all they have to do is go online and register and pay 10 euro or uh, on the day they can just come along and pay their 10 euro I would also like to mention at this point to Shane O'Neill from Aspect, Aspect Photography who came in like Alan on a voluntary basis and he took all the beautiful photographs that we're using on social media now just to tell you a little bit about the day itself it's going to be amazing Damien uh, we're so excited I mightn't sound it but we're actually so excited the, the Women's Centre is actually has been buzzing for the last two weeks um, 
Uh, Grace O'Sullivan, our local M- MEP, she's launching the walk. And we're thrilled to have a young athlete. Her name is uh, Kate Veal. She's an Irish record holder. Yes, I know, Kate. And Kate is, is going to lead the walk for us. And also to entertain us while we wait to do the walk, we have a young woman. I think she's only 15 or 16. Her name is Angel and she sings and plays the guitar and she's with the Mount Sign Choir. Super. So, so much happening. So that's yeah, on Sunday week and on then Sunday the week, yeah. unveiling is on next Wednesday. Uh, and then also on Thursday, if I could mention Thursday yeah. the 5th, we have our annual history exhibition, which um, is the uh, the work over a long number of years, a collaboration between Andy Kelly, historian and Kilmac Thomas and Anne Fitzgerald, the chairwoman of our history group. Mm. And uh, they've documented hundreds of women's profiles. And what we time is that on and where is that on? That's starting at 11 o'clock in the library and we also do um, a bonnet exhibition which commemorates the women who were transported to Van Diemen's Land from Waterford. Wow. 300, over 300 women for petty crimes like stealing a turnip and they were deemed as criminals for the rest of their lives. So, with so the, on all that information you can contact... Everything is on the website. Super. Yeah, Yeah, and... Listen, thanks so much, Breed. I'm sorry we run out of time. It's amazing how quickly the time goes, isn't yeah, it, Maureen? Yes, it is. And we haven't even got to Brexit or the coronavirus yet, I'll tell you. Listen, well we'll done. come back again to do that, Damien. Keep up the great work. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very so much. much. Maureen Tobin and Breed. I'm seeing everybody on the day. Bye bye. Mm. Thank you.